Good evening to you. I, I think we'll probably have a look at starting now because uh, we don't want to keep you too long this evening. I just want to say thank you for coming because obviously on the Thursday evenings there's plenty of other things you can be doing. And I know if I wasn't here today, um, I keep saying, well, would I watch Coronation Street? Probably. Would I go and watch EastEnders? Maybe not. But I would certainly be at Altrincham tonight watching Manchester United's reserves. But I've given that up for you. So hopefully we'll make it entertaining so it was worthwhile me not going to the reserve match. This week is uh, the Manchester Science Festival. And I think we're in day five of the Manchester Science Festival. And this is where Manchester or Greater Manchester has the chance to say what Manchester or the conurbation of the North West has been important for in terms of its science in the past and possibly in the future. I'm Steve Rossington and I work at Salford University's Centre for Drug Design, which is Salford University's chemistry department. And we've got, well, I've invited a few of my colleagues on the back here, which are some PhD students. I'm a, a Bolton lad, but I came to Salford in 1996 to do a, uh, an undergraduate degree in chemistry. And I've never really left Salford, which is probably a good thing, but then again, it might be a bad thing. And, and what today is about is to say, what do we get up to at Salford University? Why do we spend your taxpayers' money? Uh, what, what are we doing during the, our working week? And hopefully well, let's have a look at some chemistry and the contribution that Greater Manchester has made to chemistry in a you know, tongue-in-cheek, light-hearted way. So this is called Greater Manchester's Chemistry and it's about looking at two very important scientists who came from the northwest of England and said things about chemistry which were very important a few hundred years ago but are just as important today. Now, I put two very important chemists up. One of them actually might be a physicist, actually, the guy on the right-hand side, but we'll call him chemist for today, because I'm a chemist. <laughs> the guy on the left-hand side is someone called John Dalton, and he was born in the Lake District, but came to the city of Manchester, as it was then, in the late 1700s. And he said something about atoms, which is really important now, but at the time in the late 1700s, early 1800s, people didn't really believe what he was saying. The guy on the right-hand side, Ernest Rutherford, uh, some adults in the audience might know about this chap now. If you're picking up the Manchester Evening News, The Guardian, looking on the news websites, you might discover that Manchester University has had some problems over the last few years with a building called the Rutherford Building, where this chap, Ernest Rutherford, did some work in the early 1900s about atoms going to other atoms and giving off lots of energy, which is basically radioactivity. And sadly, Manchester University have had to convince the rest of the world that this building is not a radioactive hot potato anymore, but other people don't believe that. But uh, Ernest Rutherford was a New Zealander, and in the 19, 1909, he got the Nobel Prize as a Manchester University <laughs> Professor of Chemistry for saying that some atoms go to other atoms and give off lots of energy. But the guy on the left-hand side, John Dalton, to me, is a very important scientist. And in the early 1800s in Manchester, he was saying that some atoms have the ability to go to other atoms and also to form compounds. Now, what I shall do now, I'm going to get my little toy out here, which I got from Japan last year. Right. I'm a child of the 80s and Star Wars was very important to me. But this guy, John Dalton, was saying that some atoms can combine with other atoms and give compounds. So, for example, if I was to point that out there to say that's carbon in the periodic table, John Dalton was saying that atoms such as carbon can combine with atoms such as oxygen to give compounds. There it goes, off it goes. Oh, let's get that off. Uh, oops, it's having a wobbler. Right, one moment. Sorted, right. Probably won't bother us again. John Dalton was saying that some atoms combine with other atoms to give compounds. So carbon and oxygen combine together to form something called carbon dioxide. You might also get atoms such as hydrogen, jump up here, hydrogen and oxygen coming together to form a compound called water, H2O. Now, in the year 2009, that's quite obvious to us, but in the early 1800s, scientists at that point had a great problem with understanding that concept, and it was Dalton's work in the city of Manchester that made many scientists believe that what he was actually saying was, was correct. So, let's have a look at this gas called carbon dioxide. And, and obviously, some of you might know that the gas carbon dioxide is it's always in the news sometimes. It's called a greenhouse gas, and it's an atmospheric gas. So, the gases in the atmosphere are shown there, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide. And I would also, as well, at this point, like to thank a few people who came to Salford University this morning for coming again in the evening. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say now. Because carbon dioxide is a gas, but it can also be a solid as well. 
So carbon dioxide is a gas, but we at Salford University and other universities in the area can use carbon dioxide in the solid form to help us to do a bit of chemistry. So what I'm going to do now is take this top, polystyrene top, and we shall bash on here some solid carbon dioxide. Now this is carbon dioxide in the solid form. Not gas is carbon dioxide, but solid carbon dioxide. So if I was to put that on my hands like this, I've got one, two, three seconds it's burning. <laughs> one, two, three seconds it's burning again. One, two, three seconds it's burning. Now this isn't actually a heat burn, this is a cold burn. Because each individual chip of CO2 like this has a temperature to touch of minus 78 degrees C. So we're at room temperature at the moment, which is like 20 odd degrees C. We have body temperature of 37 degrees C. This is at a temperature of minus 78 degrees C. And this carbon dioxide in the solid form is not happy being a solid. It would much rather be a gas. Now normally a solid would go to a gas first by becoming a liquid, which is a process we know as melting, and then liquids go to gases in a process known as boiling. But if I was to put some CO2 down here on the surface of the table, after about 15 minutes, the solid will just simply disappear. You won't see a puddle, it just wants to go from solid to gas straight away. Now if I was to put this on my hand like this, the solid CO2 says, lovely, energy. My hand is a source of energy. I'm going to take all the energy out of, out of your hand, my hand, to turn itself from solid to gas as quickly as possible. So I start to feel a cold burn. Now, if we want to do any chemistry at the university, at round about minus 78 degrees C, we will use carbon dioxide like this to control reactions and to cool them down to that temperature. But solid CO2 like that can be used in other ways as well. First of all, it can be used in the entertainment industry, and also you can use it as well if you're a firefighter. So let's come to the entertainment industry first. So I've got here a couple of buckets of water, and this young man will dip his fingers in there for me, just to confirm that's warm. OK, is that warm? Yeah. Right, good. And let's pick on someone at the back. So we'll come over here, maybe. And this young lady will dip her fingers in there. And you, again, can confirm to me that's quite warm. We've got two buckets of warm water. Now, the CO2 is desperate to turn itself from solid to gas. So what I'm going to do is allow it the opportunity to go from solid to gas as quickly as possible. So what we'll have a look at now is what happens to the energy content of this bucket when I allow the solid carbon dioxide to go to gaseous carbon dioxide. Now, I just want one big scoop of CO2 for something in a few minutes' time. So I'm going to put that back. Right, two buckets. Right. Let's go solid to gas as quickly as possible. <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> Got ya. <laughs> so what we're doing here, we're on the solid carbon dioxide to go to gaseous carbon dioxide quite quickly. Now what we've done, we've taken, well what, we're going to take the energy out of the water to allow the solid CO2 to get all the energy it needs to turn to gaseous carbon dioxide quite quickly. Now if the energy comes out of the water, the one thing that we should guess is that the temperature of the water should go down. So, I think you were on the black bucket, young man. Want to dip your fingers in there for me? Is that warmer or a bit colder than before? Colder. A bit colder, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit colder. And a young lady over here, she'll also volunteer and dip her fingers in there. Do you want to confirm that's a little bit cooler than before? Yeah. And that should be the case because we're taking the energy out of the water to turn the solid CO2 to gassy CO2. Now, if I went like that and blew some smoke at you, did anyone feel that the smoke was quite cool on the face? Yeah. Well, that should be the case because the gaseous carbon dioxide molecules 
when they've turned themselves from solid to gas, they're still quite cool. They're not at room temperature. They might be at temperatures of minus 5, minus 10 degrees C. And they're cool gas molecules, and they can also take the water vapour from the atmosphere and cool it down. Hence, you see the smoke is a mixture of two things. It's actually cool gas molecules, but the smoke is condensed water, uh, water vapour in the atmosphere. So this smoke here is all the water vapour in the atmosphere being cooled down locally around the gas molecules. I'm going to move this over here. Now, the other use of CO2 that we might come across, and this is not the case here, so I'm going to carefully, I can just lift this up. We've got a fire extinguisher here, which is a water-based fire extinguisher. Carefully put that back. Now, this is where I've got to hope the uh, fire alarms are off in this hall, because if not, we're all going to go outside in a few minutes' time and wait for the fire brigade to come. And I say that with honesty, because I, I, I did this in uh, March this year in a school in, uh, in Dewsbury in Yorkshire, and I got the fire brigade out at 9 o'clock, and I was told by 10 o'clock the fire system was off, and at 11 o'clock we were out again in the schoolyard. So things can go wrong on doing this little trick. Now, fire extinguisher there, obviously if you've got a fire, you want to put a fire out. A fire needs oxygen to propel itself. So if you're a firefighter, what you might want to do is to smother the fire from oxygen, so oxygen shouldn't get to it. If no oxygen gets to the fire, the fire is eventually going to burn itself out, and out it goes. But the thing is, if you're a firefighter and you go to some situations, let's say there's a fire at Salford University, and, they, and there's a, one of the labs is on fire, they're probably going to ask us, what's in your lab? And you might say, well, we've got some metals in the lab, so I'm just going to bore you for a few seconds and put this slide back on. Oh, don't want to see that quite yet. Here's the uh, periodic table, and anything down here, oops, anything down here we know as metals. Uh, so if they, if they said to you, have you got any metals in the lab, you will say yes, and they wouldn't use a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Because CO2 can actually help metal fires to propel themselves to literally set fire a little bit more. So what I've got here is a little frying pan of, uh, with some carbon dioxide chips in and some grey powder and a wire in the middle. And the grey powder and wire is actually a metal called magnesium. And magnesium likes to combine with oxygen to form like a bright light. But if you were fighting this fire, you wouldn't want to go into the fire and, and put carbon dioxide onto it because obviously uh, some violent reactions could take place. So I'm going to show you that now. Because carbon dioxide has the ability to combine with the metal on fire and to make it burn a little bit more by it, literally giving its oxygen to it. So here we go, no fire extinguishers around here, which is quite good. Now, this might uh, be a bit bright to, for some of you. It's certainly going to be bright for me. It's probably going to cause me to be a bit dazzled for a few seconds afterwards. So if you're sensitive in, in you know, your sight, maybe you might want to look away, but uh, hopefully it won't blind you too much. So this is a metal fire now. We've got a nice metal on fire now. Off you go. And if you're a firefighter, you wouldn't want to be tackling that with some CO2. There we go. That's, that's all right. Now, that's raging away, which it should be going out by now, but never mind. It should be. Oh, never mind. It'll go out on its own accord. All right. I'll take that and put it at the back. That should be fine. There we go. Right. It'll probably catch on fire again in a few minutes, but never mind. I hope not. There we go. That, that'll, that'll be fine. That'll just burn away and it's on the cord. Now, that's carbon dioxide for you. It can also be a gas at room temperature, but you can also have a solid as well in carbon dioxide. But the main gas in the atmosphere is actually nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up 78% of the atmosphere, and it can exist in another form as well. We can have liquid nitrogen. Now, again, the ones at the university this morning probably saw this, and they probably tell the rest of you what I'm going to be doing in a few seconds' time. But what I'll do now, I'll put two receptacles on this front table, move the table slightly back, and I'm going to pour out some liquid nitrogen, which may look like water, but this is certainly not water at all. This is liquid nitrogen. And this has a temperature of minus 196 degrees C. And I see Sir here is moving his feet back, thinking I'm going to pour this on his feet, which I'm certainly not going to do. 
So this here is liquid nitrogen. This has a temperature of minus 196 degrees C. Right. Now, let me put that back on there quickly. Now, this liquid nitrogen here, this liquid nitrogen is cold. Now, I should really be be uh, promoting safe science. I mean, I, I'm probably in need of a very good hair cut, as you can <laughs> appreciate, and I should probably have my hair tied back and have a lab coat on and some safety spectacles, and I've certainly not got any of them on. Uh, I'm being a bit arrogant in presuming that I know what I'm doing, but if you were in a laboratory, you wouldn't be doing this at all. So it, does anyone work for the health and safety executive? <laughs> right, because if, if you do, please never report me for this and a few other things I might get up to in the next few minutes. Liquid nitrogen is very cool. The temperature of minus 196 degrees C, which is the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And it's so cool, for example, that for me to do that and that is really quite dumb. But to do that and that again after warning myself is quite ridiculous on my part. And liquid nitrogen is so cool that it can change the properties of living material. So what I'll do now, I'll show you how you can change the properties of living material quite quickly. We'll take a frying pan. And we'll crack an egg into it. Like that. Now, to, to cook an egg, you probably have to fry it, so apply heat to it. But what I'll do now is apply some liquid nitrogen to the frying pan. And we'll leave that for a few seconds over here. Put that there. And let's get an apple. and a banana. Now the good thing about doing chemistry demos is that on today I've already done two small demos this, this morning at Salford University and by doing this trick I get my five portions of fruit and veg in quite, quite nicely. So get an apple, confirm that's fresh and indeed edible, a nice banana. So the apple will go in there, so will the banana. We'll take the banana skin and we'll flick it. Nothing wrong with that. That can go in there as well. And we'll leave that for a few seconds. So let's have a look at the egg now. All right, now, and this is cold liquid nitrogen and it looks like the egg is cooked, all right? So you might be suspecting that liquid nitrogen is cold enough to change the properties of living material. And indeed, you'd be quite right with that. So we'll put that over there for the moment. Let's come back to the fruit and the banana skin is now going to shatter right? and the, the banana is going to bang like that and the apple will like that, like a cricket ball. Now let's get the banana and have a... <laughs> can't do that. And the apple, <laughs> quite cool too, right? <laughs> quite cool. Now, I've been fortunate enough to be doing these kind of demos for about four years now. And about two years ago, I did this in a school in Oldham. And I bit into an apple. I thought, gosh, it's a bit cold this. And it actually happened to freeze my cheek to my tongue, which was quite fun. So in front of about 150 school kids, I realised I was in trouble and I had to literally pull my cheek away from my tongue and I had a massive cut. Uh, a cold burn in my mouth and uh, literally was spilling, uh, spitting blood out for the rest of the morning there which was not good and liquid nitrogen is cold and it can have some really severe consequences on living material and that's my foot in June time this year and uh, I probably said to uh, my colleagues at the back don't repeat this to the health and safety office at the university but this was one June morning um, I think it was a Wednesday morning and I have to say to you I was a little bit hungover my fault, I was out the night before and it's a rock gig and uh, I was pouring some liquid nitrogen out the back of the building and I spilt it on my foot and I thought, oh my foot's a bit cold now, rip my shoe off, get my sock off straight away and I thought, I'm okay, I'll put my shoes and socks on and that was about five hours later at home, a very severe blister on my foot which I had to keep cutting for the course of the next couple of days to get the, uh, the blister out of the way and actually uh, this wooden floor reminds me of something as well. I was in London in June time this year and I was pouring liquid nitrogen out onto a wooden floor. So I was down on my right knee pouring liquid nitrogen out and I got up 
And I thought, hmm, I think my trouser leg's a bit stuck there to the floor. Well, I'll get up. It's only a pair of trousers, doesn't matter. And I managed as well to rip all the skin off my knee off. And a massive blister on my knee, which is quite fun. That weekend I was sat at home, literally cutting my knee open every five or six hours, letting this blister go out. Now, linen material is quite easily affected by liquid nitrogen, but other material is okay if you don't pick on it when it comes out of the cold nitrogen. So basically, living material, you and I, the apple and the banana, got things in common that we're all made up of cells and our cells contain water. Now this material here, this rubber material, is not, has not got any water to it at all. And this is a polymer material and it's nice and flexible at room temperature. Now if we were to put this polymer material into liquid nitrogen, like this, all right, we'll dip the polymer into the liquid nitrogen like this. And let's cool it down quickly. So again, I shouldn't be dipping my fingers in here, but never mind. All for life science. And let's pull this out. Now, if I wanted to, I could probably shatter that rubber tubing now because this material, this rubber now, has got different properties at a temperature of minus 196 degrees C than it has at room temperature. Basically, it's inflexible and it's brittle. And if I wanted to, I can shatter it. But I don't want to do that yet. What I want to do is give it energy back I've taken energy by dipping it into a minus 196 degrees C. What I want to do is give it energy back by warming it with my hands. So again, this is where I'll probably get cold blisters in the next few days on, on my hands and probably get red raw hands. But by warming it up like this, we should be making the tube inflexible again. I'll just warm this bit of tubing up. Oh, I've snapped it. <laughs> Pretend I didn't do that. Let's warm that up. Warm it up and it should become flexible again but if I quickly cool it down and I'm gonna cool it like this now we'll cool it down again quite quickly there we go and if I'm strong enough and I hope I am ah, no I'm not Oop, there we go on the cameraman there we go so that's got different properties than it had a few seconds ago. But if we warm the tubing back up again, the rubber tubing will be get its natural properties back and become nice and flexible again. Now, myself, so I've been at Salford University for about, well, 13 years near enough. And I've been fortunate enough to have, allow myself time to do a, an undergraduate degree and a PhD in the medicinal chemistry. And when you're at any university, Salford's just around the corner, Manchester's down the road, Manchester Met, you go to Liverpool, Leeds, or if you do any kind of discipline, your lecturers automatically insist on you knowing the laws of your subject. So if you're doing science, you should know the laws of science. Now in chemistry, there's some important laws which are quite boring, and one of them is called the gas laws, and basically it dictates how a volume of gas behaves when you change temperature or pressure. So I'm going to take a volume of gas now. tie a knot into it. So here's a freshly blown and tied balloon. And this now is a volume of gas. And in chemistry there's a gas law that basically now tells me what will happen to this gas if I was to cool it down. And this is called Charles's law and it basically tells us that the volume of the gas is proportional to its temperature. So here's a gas at room temperature, 25 degrees C, and this gas law tells me if I put this ga uh, gas into minus 196 degrees C, we should cool, we should cool and indeed shrink the gas down. So let's see if that's going to be the case. So we take a gas at 25 degrees C and we put it into a temperature of minus 196 degrees C. And the balloon is actually going down inside of this liquid nitrogen. So I'll put that over there for the moment. Put that over there and we'll push it in. And again, don't want to get my fingers into here too much. And we get now a gas which should be warming back towards room temperature. So our gas molecules regain their own e their energy and the gas goes back towards its natural volume. Now, if I'm walking along, can anyone see any liquid in there? Or did anyone see any liquid in the balloon when I was walking at the front there? I'll just cool it down again quickly and we'll try and see if we can hold the balloon up to a light source so you can see the liquid a bit more. Put you in there. Right, here we go. Right, 
So let's have a look again. Can anyone see a liquid down there? Now the liquid, if the balloon doesn't pop, the liquid should, in a few seconds time, disappear. Now, this liquid is actually another gas, which is now liquefying out into solution by the cold liquid nitrogen. Now I'm going to put this slide on again. Liquid nitrogen is so cold, it has the ability to take oxygen gas from the atmosphere and cool it down. So basically, liquid nitrogen can generate liquid oxygen. And liquid oxygen is a special gas. Well, it's not, it's not a gas, it's a liquid. Liquid oxygen is a special material because one thing that liquid oxygen loves to do in life is set things on fire. It's highly combustible. Now, before the majority of you came into the audience this evening, I had a little gas cylinder here and I generated some liquid oxygen. So basically, I bubbled some oxygen gas through liquid nitrogen. And we've got a small quantity, I, I would hope, we don't need too much of this, of a blue liquid called liquid oxygen. So I probably can only show some of you this. I might just show the younger members of the audience. Can you see a blue liquid in there? Yeah, we can see a blue liquid. All right, I'll just show a blue liquid. All right, we'll just, a blue liquid, you see a blue liquid? Yeah. All right, we have got a blue liquid in here. I might just show these two young ladies. And this blue liquid is liquid oxygen. And liquid oxygen is really, really combustible. So it loves to set things on fire. But instead of talking about fire, let's talk about your tea. Who's had the tea before they came here this evening? All right, just a few. I'm going to get my tea when I get home later tonight. But if you're eating food, what you're doing basically as human beings, you're taking food material and you're combining it with gaseous oxygen from the, the atmosphere and you're making energy for yourself over the course of the day. Now, the younger members in the audience here, when you start to go to GCSE level towards the end of your GCSE life, 14 and 15, you will realise or you'll learn that this process is called respiration. So, for example, if I was quite peckish and I wanted to uh, have a nibble on some biscuits, so I'll quickly crush a biscuit up over here. If I was quite peckish, I would have a nibble on a biscuit. All right. And hopefully, break the biscuit material down, which is sugars, and combine it with oxygen from the atmosphere through breathing in to make enough energy to power myself for the rest of the day until tomorrow when it's uh, breakfast time. So what I'll do now, I'm going to show you that when you combine oxygen gas with a food material like this, it's actually a process of combustion. To us chemists, this is a process of combustion. And you actually get quite a lot of energy released from material when you combust it. Now our human body is absolutely fantastic because we combine these biscuits with enough oxygen at the right time to produce energy over a course of a few hours. And that suits us quite nicely because if we didn't, if something was wrong and we released all the energy at once, we might literally blow up, which wouldn't be good news. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to set some crushed up biscuits and I'm going to show you how much energy is in about 100 grams of biscuit material. Or biscuits, right. There we go. Now where's my uh, liquid oxygen? Well, it's over here. Right, we'll take the liquid oxygen and I'm going to pour the liquid oxygen onto the biscuit. And now, what we should be seeing in a few seconds time is a process called combustion. So let's see how much energy is trapped inside of this 100 grams of biscuit. Right, move you out of the way. Right, well, quite a lot of energy. Right, so there's quite a lot of energy. And I bet you're pleased you don't do that when you sit on the uh, settee at night eating your biscuits. Right. Now, oxygen, as I said, combining with biscuit material there, when it combines with, bis with a biscuit and releases energy, that's a process called combustion. And combustion to us chemists is where you take an organic material, so that's containing the atoms carbon and hydrogen, and put them with oxygen and hopefully release some energy. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you hopefully some processes of combustion but this time with liquids, not with solid biscuits. And this is my favourite organic liquid. 
it really is a pleasure to partake in this. And can I, can the man just ha ha put his hand up? This is my, go on, put your hand up. This is my friend from the university, and he's a he's a scurrilous young lad. He corrupts me sometimes on Friday evenings. The Crescent Pub, we sometimes are found to be in the Crescent Pub late on on Friday nights, and we basically get quite drunk on this material called ethanol. And ethanol is an organic material containing carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And this ethanol here can actually combine with oxygen in a process called combustion and release energy. So what we'll hopefully do now is release all the energy from the, uh, the ethanol. So I just need this bottle. I need to put the bottle there. And I need to get this funnel. Right. So we've got this ethanol which we will be uh, partaking of tomorrow evening. And we'll give it a shake. We'll pour out the excess ethanol. Put it in there. Right, and let's put that there. And you can tell I'm very organised. I keep looking for things all over the stage. I'm trying to find my matches now. Where did I leave my matches? They're down there, are they? Oh, they're there. Brilliant. There we are. Right, let's see how much energy is in this alcohol. So. Hopefully myself and uh, a man tomorrow shouldn't be uh, suffering from this after another pint. Let's see how much energy is in here. Oh, the match has gone out. Wet matches, I think. I think so. Is it annoying this when you, you're doing something live and you, your equipment doesn't work? Come on, matches, light. There we go. Oh, there we are. That's quite nice. So that's some energy release from an alcohol. Now, that's our favourite alcohol, but you can also have other alcohols as well. So, for example, you might have another alcohol called IPA, which is we use in the chemistry labs, called isopropanol, and this is a very important solvent for reactions. So let's see how much energy is combined with this. We'll put that there. Again, let's have a look to see what energy we're going to release here. There we go. So that's now gaseous oxygen combining with organic material to release energy. But you can have oxygen as well trapped inside of other sources. So what we'll do now, I'm going to show you a liquid this clear liquid, and this liquid here is hydrogen peroxide, uh, or peroxide as it's commonly known. Now, I'm sure many of you in the audience might know the, the main uses and desires of peroxide, and that's basically when you go to the hairdressers, you want to take your hair colour to that bleachy blonde look, you might use some peroxide, or the hairdresser might slap this on your, on your barnet for you. So what we'll do now, we're going to say that peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, this solution here, as the formula H2O2. So this is what this guy John Dalton was saying 200 years ago, atoms combining together to form compounds. This compound is H2O2. And hydrogen peroxide basically wants to release oxygen. Now, if this goes on your hair follicle, the oxygen can be released to the hair follicle, literally take the texture of the hair follicle and, and bleach it as such, and then you've got a nice blonde look to you. But the oxygen here in this hydrogen peroxide is released over a period of about seven to eight months, which is really a long time to wait if you were a scientist in the lab and you wanted all the oxygen to be released at once. So what I'll do now, I'm going to hold up this beaker of hydrogen peroxide like this, and in that beaker of hydrogen peroxide, I would estimate, if I can do my maths correctly, that there's about 45 balloons worth of oxygen gas trapped inside of here. And the peroxide would like to release the oxygen over a period of seven to eight months, which is too long to wait. Now, what we do as scientists at this point, if we're faced with slow reactions, we literally want to encourage the reactions to speed up. So we're going to use another material which will speed up a chemical reaction, and these are called catalysts. So this clear solution now, I would hope, if I've made it up correctly, is my special catalyst for this reaction. So what I'm looking for here is to release the, the gas over a, a couple of minutes and not seven to eight months. I think something's going to happen. I can see something happening. So something's going to rise up, put a bit more in, no problem there. So we're looking to release about 45 balloons worth 
of oxygen gas over a period of a couple of minutes and not seven to eight minutes. So while that's taking place, I just need to quickly clear this up for one second, do something else. Now, so we should now be releasing our 45 balloons worth of oxygen gas over two minutes or so, and not seven or eight months. Now, can anyone, I know it's a bit smoky at the front because I've been messing around, can anyone see some steam? See some steam if I stand over the top here and probably don't get these microphones in here because the chaps wouldn't like that. But we've got some steam being generated now because the reaction of hydrogen peroxide going to water and oxygen gas actually releases energy as well. Now, there we are. Well, I'll be clearing this up in a few minutes' time. I hope the community centre don't see this. So I'll be in big trouble, big trouble for this. Right, now, that's hot oxygen trapped inside of a liquid. You can also have oxygen, if we get this next slide up, you can also have oxygen as well trapped inside of solids. So I've got over here some purple crystals. Right, so these purple crystals contain a, a compound called potassium permanganate, KMNO4. And basically, as a chemist, I can tell you now that these, these purple crystals have lots of oxygen trapped inside of them. And this also wants to release its oxygen. So what we'll try and do now, we'll, we'll try and allow the potassium permanganate to release all its oxygen at once. And hopefully this will go with, I would hope, a little bit of a crack. Oops. I'm going to put a liquid in there to get things going and hopefully yeah, a nice little fire on the go and let's release all the oxygen from the potassium permanganate now. now so if this goes right I've got to move my hands quite quickly here because I've, I've been known to burn my fingers doing this. I've got one, two, three seconds. There we go. And I probably did catch my finger there. <laughs> Out you go. Now, that's kind of oxygen gas for you. But let me just quickly put this slide back to, up again. Some of the gases in the atmosphere, nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide. There are more gases in the atmosphere. You can have nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, so on and so forth. You can have the noble gases. There's also a gas in the atmosphere as well. You would possibly, possibly, wouldn't want too much of it around. And what I've got here is a red gas cylinder and a couple of balloons, which I'm going to take away from these nice young ladies who've been guarding it for the last 40 minutes or so. And there's a gas in the atmosphere, or there could be a gas in the atmosphere called hydrogen. Now, but I will tell you now, if hydrogen makes, made up the atmosphere, you wouldn't want too much hydrogen making up the atmosphere, because this gas is an explosive gas and it does like to set things on fire. Now, let's get my uh, trajectory right here. I've got a little rocket launcher and hopefully this will work. And I'm going to try and aim it towards the ceiling. All right, so I'm going to try and aim it towards the ceiling here. Now, we'll put it there, that'll do. Right, now, this gas called hydrogen this gas called hydrogen, oops, let's put this back. Hydrogen can combine with oxygen gas to create water and hopefully lots of energy. Now, this is quite useful if you're NASA, because if you want to send a, a spacecraft up into space, rockets or, or spacecrafts are powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And I think yesterday there was a spacecraft launched uh, uh, in Florida, and hopefully what we'll try and do now is replicate the launch of this spacecraft in tribute to NASA in Sulphur this evening by, if we can, firing this rocket to that roof beam. Well, I hope I've got my proportions right here. Now, this sometimes can go wrong because obviously 
This, this is, all, is all due to me making up the right proportion of hydrogen gas and oxygen in this bottle. And if I don't do it right, then I'm going to look like a real idiot. But hopefully I've not done it wrong this afternoon. Right, now, before we start, I'm going to set fire to this stick. One second. In fact, Roman, come here. I've got a volunteer for you. And for the first time ever, I've got a volunteer. Come here. He's a great lad, he's a man. He, he really does, though, corrupt me with his, uh, his beer-buying ability. He keeps buying me beers after beers after beers, and he doesn't realise I live in Bolton and I've got to get home at night. <laughs> right, hold the stick there. Now, we work for the same boss at Salford University, and I'm sure if he saw us this evening setting fire to liquid oxygen, he wouldn't be happy with us, so we're not going to tell him in the morning what we were doing. Right, you, if this works, you might want to put your fingers in your ears. OK. You might want to put your fingers in your ears. Thank you. Go on, do you want to do it? Yeah. Right, OK. There we go. Just one moment. Now, this is quite a novelty, this, because I actually managed to find a three-litre pot bottle. Now, I never find these too much. Obviously, cider bottles are three litres in volume, but I don't drink too much cider. Maybe we should try that and collect the bottles. Right. So let's see what a three litre bottle might do now. See if we can fire that off into the atmosphere. Oops. Probably won't work this actually. Oops. It probably won't work. I've not thought of this one through. No, we won't do that because I've not thought of this one through. Right, thank you. We can sort out the problem. We can sort it out, yeah. Right. Now, this gas hydrogen. This gas hydrogen, H2, is actually a flammable gas. So you wouldn't want too much hydrogen around you. Like, for example, if you did happen to smoke and you're outside a, 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 a restaurant or a pub and you're having a little bit of a cigarette outside and a balloon full of hydrogen came your way, you might have some uh, severe consequences with that. This gas hydrogen is a very flammable gas and it does want to set things on fire. Right. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this gas cylinder, which has got hydrogen in, and I'm going to blow a balloon's worth of hydrogen into it. So let's, uh, let's open this up. There we go. And I embarrass myself by tying the knot live. You can't tie knots properly. Put the knot inside of the balloon. There we go, and let's let go of the balloon and we'll see it uh, rising towards the top of the uh, ceiling. Now, what does that tell us possibly about hydrogen gas? It's, it's light, it's a light gas, right? This hydrogen gas, I I'm telling you it's an explosive gas, but it's also a light gas. Now, does anyone else know of another light gas? Helium. Helium. What does helium do? Makes your voice go squeaky. Now, this young man over here can answer this one. So we've got heli uh, helium, a light gas, it makes your voice go squeaky. So, I'm Stephen, you are... Your name is? Laurie. Laurie? Lauren. L Lauren. Lauren, right, Lauren. We've only just met about 40 minutes ago, but do you think I'm stupid enough to take some hydrogen gas, which is explosive, breathe it in to prove to you that it, squeak it makes your voice go squeaky? Do you think I'm going to be stupid enough to do that? <laughs> and he's right. So again, this is where, if you did work for that health and safety executive, you must not report me tomorrow for doing this. Because right? I would be in trouble. Big trouble. <laughs> How rude of me. <laughs> there we go. Hydrogen gas, right. Just put that there. So let's see if that's right. Let's see if my voice goes squeaking out on the results of hydrogen gas. <sighs> well, good evening. <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed. <laughs> You're 40 minutes here. We will try to finish. We 
with a bang. <coughs> now, <coughs> we literally will. <coughs> so again, if, you, if you're delicate hearing, you might want to put your fingers in your ears here. Um, oh, let's get that. So this is the same gas, which is now in my lungs. It's not good news. Good job I don't smoke. Okay, do you want to put your fingers in your ears if possible? There we go. Right. Do it again. Do it again, he says. We might do it in a second at a time. No. I'll kind of think, kind of stop there, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much for your attention. And, and just to again uh, remind you that Soft University, for the younger members of the audience, is just around the corner from here. Uh, it's about half a mile that way, I would say. And Salford University, after the City Council of Salford, is possibly the, well, it's the second biggest employer in the city. I f- am fortunate enough to count myself one of 2,800 staff members. There's about 19,000 undergraduates at the campus and about 3,000 MSc and PhD research students over the campus as well. And that's the building we work in. And we work on this floor here, the third floor. It's the Cockroft building on the Peel Park campus. And from our campus here, you can see the city centre of Manchester. And I'll just move through this. And I just want to say thank you as well. Is he around, Antonio? Antonio, hold your hand up. Thank you for Antonio for the cash for today, um, for booking out this uh, community centre. Uh, Antonio works at uh, the uh, Manchester, Mo- Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, Mose, or Mose. And he's responsible for, well, activities such as the Manchester Science Festival, which is in its third year, I believe. It's in its third year, and hopefully it will grow over the next 5, 10, 15 years and become a bigger phenomenon through the North West. And we should just say as well, thank you to the North West Development Agency. And I will just say as well that uh, maybe I'm probably a touch out of order by saying this, but I'll go and say it anyway. Uh, We at South University, uh, well, we, we, we get taxpayers' money. We're all supported by the university. But as well, we try and find touches of money to do research. And there's a university uh, charity called KidScan, which is uh, trying to support some of us to do our research. So it helps to buy the chemicals that we need to do our work. And to do any kind of research, we probably cost about £40,000 each per year with the chemicals and the costings that we run up as well uh, to do our chemistry for the year. So it's an expensive business. And I'll just quickly say that if you wanted to, there's a tin outside. If you wanted to put an old button in or a pole or mint or whatever, feel free to do that. And at least I'll have another button then to stitch on my pants tomorrow morning. OK, so I just want to thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a tongue-in-cheek way of looking at chemistry. And if you ever grow up to be a chemist, uh, just get your hair cut and don't look like me at 31-year-old, <laughs> looking like something from 1979. OK, thank you so much. Thank you.